Up next, a Q&A from you. What do you do if you own the 2.0-litre twin-turbo Ranger or Everest with the 10-speed automatic transmission and the shift quality is making like all of those lemmings over the cliff going downhill somewhat rapidly? I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars. Australia only even Ford's website, card. Now, we'll get into this in just a second. I suppose the easiest way to handle it would be just make friends with Doctor Who and get in the TARDIS and go back in time and you know, take care of Hitler and then not buy the Everest or the Ranger and then we wouldn't all be detained here on an otherwise perfectly serviceable Christ knows when evening or afternoon. We'll get into this question in just a sec, but first. This video is sponsored by Olight. There's a sale on right now, which ends Thursday, the 29th of September at midnight. Discounts up to 50% until then. Some of the highlights now. The all new audience is the perfect workshop, camping and in-vehicle roadside repair light. Marauder 2 is a powerhouse packing 14,000 lumens with flood mode and spot mode. For search. O-Lantern Classic 2 Pro, which is great for camping and also dead handy around the backyard barbecue. Baton 3 Pro, compact and affordable for everyday carry, but with a 1500 lumen punch when you crank it right up. Heron 2, the right angle flashlight that morphs seamlessly into a powerful head torch using the included elastic headband rig. And lastly, two new O knives, the Rabato, a Tanto style 154 chrome molly blade with a rail lock, and the tiny but useful mini Drever with N690 stainless steel sheep's foot blade. Both blades roughly 58 Rockwell C hardness, they're titanium coated and the knives feature grippy G10 scales. There's a link in the description plus a code for 12% off outside the sale. I use an Olight Warrior Mini 2 every day and it has been totally dependable. Anyway, significant savings right across the Olight range right now if you're interested. Okay, so if you're looking for a non-Jules Verne solution here, let's get into this question. It's from Ian Gleek. Glico! Thanks for your interest, Ian. I appreciate the question, mate. I think a lot of people are probably in your position in some way or another. Now, Glico hasn't told me whether he's got a Ranger or an Everest, but it's got to be one of the two. Wondering if you can give me advice on the 2.0-litre twin-turbo 10-speed. At about 8,000 kilometres, I noticed the transmission when cold in the morning under 5 degrees doesn't want to move or holds gears until it warms up. Well... Lots of automatic transmissions kind of do that to a greater or lesser extent, and you should never expect the shift quality to be kind of Goldilocks until, you know, normal operating temperature is achieved. Anyway, Glico says, I reported it when having the 15,000k service, and they said they've reset the transmission. Standard dealership rhetoric right there. They also said to warm the motor transmission before driving off. How do you warm the transmission before driving off? That would take quite some time. Anyway, I suppose the torque converter is sort of churning and burning, but I don't believe in warming cars up. You know, by the time you've got your seatbelt on and checked the rearview mirror and gotten out onto the road, good to go, gently, until the uh, standard operating temperature is achieved, and then you can just drive it like you stole it, if that is your want. Glico says, I've owned eight Pagios over the years, and never had that happen. I stuck with Pajeros this time. Apostrophe both times. Clico, no apostrophes for plurals, dude. There's no apostrophe in Pajeros or CDs or DVDs or any of that stuff. It just do try to keep up. Because I travel remote outback for four months of the year, towing a hybrid van and found them to be bulletproof. Two words, bulletproof. There you go. Have you heard of this problem? What is your advice, please? Well, look, the 10-speed transmission that goes on that 2-litre twin-turbo diesel Ford engine is a bit of a lemon historically. It's the subject of numerous class actions for rough shift quality and dogs and cats living together in the United States. And it's 
not the slickest transmission on earth. And the other thing you've got to say to yourself is, if you've got a vehicle with an engine that develops something like 500 newton metres of torque, how many ratios does it really need to avoid being in a driving situation where it can't be at the Goldilocks revs. Like 10 is excessive for that. It just is. It's like they just did it for the bragging rights because once you've got more than about seven or eight ratios, it really is just, you know, mine's bigger than yours kind of thing in automotive engineering, right? So there's that to consider. But that transmission is kind of renowned for problems, okay? It's shift quality related problems and I doubt it will ever be any different. However, I'd say that if it's really just happening when the car is cold and it goes away when it warms up and that isn't really changing over time, then that's not a problem. It's an operational characteristic. So you should just suck it up like a big boy and deal with it. And you've got your concerns on file with them in case the transmission does go poopy in its trousers. And this uh, operational characteristic is actually emblematic of something that's on the path to failure. But I don't think it is, right? I think it's just something that you've noticed that's different from all of the Pagio apostrophe S that you owned in the past, Okay. So it's very important to put those concerns in writing and I'd be using an email server that doesn't delete the messages like your Gmail server or something like that and I'd be putting them to Ford and the dealership that you purchased the vehicle from just so that it's on the record so that there, if there is a big problem down the track you've got this documentary evidence in case you need to take them on in consumer court. I hope it doesn't come to that. If it gets worse, I'd bring it up with them again and I'd document it, right? Because Ford is notoriously bad at customer care. So there's that as well. They're also pretty bad at engineering. So they're, they're bad at reliability, bad at customer care, which is why I don't recommend them. But I really want to love Ranger. And I kind of don't mind Everest either. I'd, if the world were perfect and you could unfuck them on reliability and customer care... I'd be in a Ranger tomorrow because I just, I really like them. They, there's something about them. It's intangible. I like it, you know, and they're quite capable as well when they're not going poopy in their trousers and you're asking the dealer for support and he's going, Ford said, no can do, dude. So there's that kind of stuff to consider. It's like vehicles with oil consumption problems, okay? If your vehicle consumes oil from the get-go and it consumes the same amount of oil every 5,000 Ks, it's not getting worse, then that's not a problem. That's an operational characteristic. And you just need to know that and you just need to add a bit of oil every, I don't know, 5,000 Ks or whatever makes sense, okay? You should be checking your oil anyway basically. But a lot of people go, oh, my engine's consuming oil, it's a lemon, it's going to fail, blah, blah, blah. If it's going to fail, here's what happens. Your engine starts consuming oil. Then 20,000 Ks later, it's consuming even more oil. And another 20,000 Ks later, you're tipping, you know, five litres in every thousand Ks or something. That's a disaster. That is absolutely an engine on the road to premature failure. But if it's 500 mils of oil every 5,000 Ks, and it's been that way for the past 30,000 Ks, and it's not changing, then that's just because they wound back the clearances and the tension in the rings in R&D, and you're getting a fuel economy benefit from that. They don't tell you that so much, but they've got targets to meet, and they wind these tensions back to meet the targets, and one of the feedback effects is oil consumption. And people treat that like it's, oh, Jesus Christ, this is, oh, you know, dogs and cats, all of that. It's really not. And I'd suggest that shift quality when a transmission is cold is kind of that. It's something that you just deal with because it's fleeting, dude. It lasts for three minutes. And if it's not getting any worse and the shift quality is fine when the car is operating at its normal operation operating temperature, then you got nothing to worry about, okay? So that's how I'd treat it, but I'd make sure that my concerns are in black and white in case you need to refer to them later.